Hi everyone, it's Floyd here, uh, as always at Engineers HQ. Thank you for joining us. Uh, today, I'm really pleased to say we're joined by Oleg Zinavsky, Principal Applied Scientist at WAVE. For those of you who don't know, WAVE has raised over $250 million in funding uh, in recent years and is a pioneer in the world of self-driving vehicles, using end-to-end -end deep learning and computer vision techniques to revolutionize how, how vehicles navigate real-world environments in the safest way possible. Today, we're going to be talking about a range of topics, including the challenges of autonomous driving, LiDAR versus computer vision-based self-driving, and the futuristic world of simulated cities. So firstly, Oleg, thank you very much for joining Engineers today. It's a privilege to welcome you to the podcast. Let's kick off with an intro to you. Talk us through where you started, your journey to date, where you are today with WAVE, and, and uh, I think more specifically, your remit within WAVE as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot, Floyd, for inviting. Uh, yeah, I started uh, with robotic and uh, robotics and navigation uh, about maybe 20 years ago already. So as a student, uh, I participated in robot football uh, competitions where I was uh, right away kind of in charge of uh, multi-agent aspects and control of uh, robotic football players. And then, uh, so I was just always in this navigation space, but then I got interested in... Uh, uh, human brain and everything related to biology and so on. Started playing with genetic algorithms like many people, you know, in, in that era before deep learning. Uh, and eventually ended up uh, doing a PhD in computational neuroscience, specifically reinforcement learning in uh, computational neuroscience, the specific types of neurons, which are called spiky neurons. And uh, because of that, kind of landed a job at a company called BrainCorp. And, and the idea was to do neuromorphic hardware together with Qualcomm. Uh, it was again uh, before deep learning, so people kind of didn't know uh, what to do. People knew like, okay, we have to do something neural, but uh, uh, you know, that was a bet on a biologically, biologically plausible uh, models. So this is where I started my career. It's like heavily neuroscience influenced. I went to a lot of neuroscience uh, conferences, uh, you know, just actual biology, but then, uh, later, yeah, deep learning took off, and uh, we switched to that, where the main idea was to uh, drive robots from human demonstrations. And this is the area that kind of is, uh, I guess, the main focus of the whole my career, is how to so humans demonstrate to robots what to do, and robots do that. So we eventually released uh, with BrainCorp uh, this product, where you uh, sit on a robot, drive it around, and, uh, you, uh, and the robot kind of repeats uh, what needed to be done. We use it for like shelf scanning, cleaning floors, delivering stuff, and so on. And um, uh, this is where company kind of grew. We got a lot of funding, and this is me myself. I got into management and uh, eventually became uh, even a VP of uh, research at, at BrainCorp. And to learn uh, all the self driving stack as well, because we switched from maybe end to end technologies to more like SLAM and motion planning, which is parts of typical self driving stack. Uh, yeah, and eventually, uh, uh, a year and a half ago, uh, I kind of continued this journey and joined WAVE. Uh, and WAVE is doing also uh, effectively driving for navigation from human demonstrations, uh, except that uh, WAVE is doing it for self-driving, for actual cars on the road, whereas before I was doing it indoors. Uh, and the focus of WAVE is to do it end-to-end. -end. So currently I'm a, a scientist, principal scientist, uh, that works on uh, enforcement learning, uh, language models, and things like that might discuss in the future. Perfect. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. And and I think now, particularly for those who may not know, and I think there's been tons of media coverage around WAVE in particular, I think, and the efforts you're going to. Um, I think there was a video floating around not too long ago of Bill Gates taking a ride in one of your vehicles as well, which was um, which was super interesting. But talk to us about WAVE specifically, um, the mission and the journey that you're on as a, as a business um, and as an innovator. and I think most importantly, how does WAVE differentiate themselves to many of the other self-driving vehicle companies? Because I think it's certainly in recent years been a really popular space where many companies are trying and, and not all succeeding in, in breaking through in, in, in autonomous driving, especially with cars on public roads, right? Um, to talk to us about that, how is WAVE different and what is it you're doing? Yeah, yeah so WAVE uh, is founded uh, in 2017, actually. Uh, in Cambridge, uh, so yeah, I joined quite recently, but yeah, they have a bit of a history, and uh, so they moved uh, 
to London in uh, about 2019, if I remember correctly. And this is where they, they released the first uh, self-driving prototype, um, a car in central London driving autonomously. And uh, they got into partnership with ASDA and Akado, uh, who got interested in this technology for, you know, for delivery reasons, obviously. Uh, and uh, so in, in, in February 22, quite recently, uh, we finally got quite a, you know, decent funding, uh, 200 million, uh, as, as you mentioned. And uh, this is like a big, uh, big deal. We have a partnership with Hulk, uh with uh, Microsoft, Asda, and, uh, you know, and everyone. And uh, so the main idea of the company is to obviously solve self-driving, right? But, the, uh, you know, Wave wants to be just kind of this main power and embodied intelligence in the first place, right? So it's not, uh, hopefully we just start with uh, just navigation for self-driving and just, uh, you know, become, uh, just grow our kind of portfolio, right, of navigation technologies. Uh, and the main differentiator, uh, as you asked, is, is this idea that uh, Wave bets on end-to-end -end, uh, neural networks for solving navigation, uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, slowly, going to be more and common more common and common but uh wave uh, started doing it from pretty much its origin which is a big uh a big deal for for, for, for such a company for like a startup right so they started doing end-to-end -end, and this is the reason i'm excited about this where uh because yeah i also kind of believe in that idea and uh yeah they have a just big history just doing that literally from uh, ground up when, uh, when they were founded Sure. Okay. And talk to me about that that end to end piece that you mentioned, um, because maybe uh, not all uh, self driving uh, innovators, companies, startups, scale ups, whatever they may be, probably don't focus on that end to end all of the time, right? So, what does that mean for Wave when we talk about kind of end to end? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I guess uh, yeah. First, we need to understand like what are we comparing with, right? And uh, uh, the origin of self driving really is this DARPA challenge that happened. Uh, I don't remember, like in early 2000s, uh, where DARPA made this effort to just go for the desert first and for the city, the autonomous cars. And this is, uh, you know, many people who participated in this challenge gave rise to companies like Waymo and uh, other self-driving companies. And uh, that uh, the stack, the self-driving stack that people use there uh, kind of came from robotics, from uh, traditional robotics. And it involves components, right? It mainly involves SLAM, which is a mapping technology where you build a map uh, of your environment. It involves motion planning, where you uh, look at your map, look at the stuff that you see, uh, and build certain plans. And uh, perception, where you perceive objects, uh, you know, you look at bounding boxes, etc. Uh, uh, but uh, end to end, uh, like the the the, uh, the technology that Wave bets on, right, is this idea where you uh, kind of do it more uh, as a one big component, right? Where there's a big neural network that uh, takes inputs from uh, sensors, from cameras, uh, from other sensors, right? And then just uh, uh, just goes on, processes that, and then outputs uh, motion commands or motion plans. And the whole thing is trained out of data, right? So it's a kind of uh, data-driven approach, although other component bases also could be data-driven. And it could be trained with all sorts of machine learning techniques, reinforcement learning, uh, all the things that we might hear from uh, machine learning community, right? And uh, you know why why kind of do that, right? So first of all, we have uh, you know proof of existence from biology, right? We have humans who uh, you know you 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 don't want to think about us as uh, having a lot of components, although it's possible to think that way. You have like a visual uh, part of your brain and like, decision making, etc. Uh, but at the end of the day, we just have one brain, right? That just uh, learns from data, from the experience, from all sorts of sources, including, I don't know, driving uh, itself and then uh, learning from books and observing someone else driving and uh, being a pedestrian and then also observing that. But it's, it's all a data-driven development. And uh, that's kind of one uh, bet that, okay, well, we know that that's possible. Uh, we know that if we go this neural approach, there is at least one solution that we know, right? And then the tricky part is to how to do that, uh, you know, with the artificial neural networks. Uh, yeah, but I mean, uh, this, this was the beginning, but right now I don't think it's like, uh, and we, we call it uh, AV 2.0, uh, kind of from uh, Karpaty 
uh, software 2.0 uh, from Tesla definition, right? Saying that, okay, well, we're kind of moving next uh, meta level where we're programming from data. But uh, in reality, you know, to be to be uh, honest, uh, you know, many companies are kind of right now not one or two a component or deep. They are all mixing things, right? So Tesla, for example, mixing uh, perception and spatial reasoning, and then they already advertised recently that they're going also end-to-end -end approach, and then obviously all computer vision is uh, deep learning based. Uh, so <clears throat> we're kind of going one way, uh, you know. We just started with that right away, right? Instead of doing evolutionary. So this is the path of the company, such that instead of uh, betting on first components and then making them deep, this is what other self-driving companies uh, are heading to. Uh, we decided to right away go, okay, well, we know the endpoint. So let's just try to figure out the final uh, structure right away, right? And there are pros and cons for to both approaches, right? So. Uh, pros for end-to-end -end would be, okay, first of all, it's data-driven, so that's why, uh, you know, the benefit of that is that you uh, don't have to code up all the human knowledge uh, kind of explicitly. You just learn it from observations, from data. Uh, at the same time, you need to have a lot of data, right, which is, a you know, data is a new oil, right, like, as they say. And then, <laughs> uh, so that's why we have to do, like, a lot of data engineering, right, which is not really the, really the case in classical uh kind of com uh, companies although it's also a big factor uh but uh, also another thing is that abstractions are not lost between components so if you connect two things together uh you have to design some kind of interface and this is again a decision making which humans have mm -hmm. to do and then uh with end-to-end -end networks uh you kind of naturally bridge that gap automatically right you kind of hope uh, that it's going to be bridged and there will be no bad biases right and uh, one few cool things that I, I learned actually on the spot when I joined, I didn't think about this before, is that uh, one of the upside is that one single person, one developer can actually comprehend the whole system. This is completely not the case wow. for, yeah, for like a regular stack where you have to be expert in that component, in this component. And so here, one person can just look at the whole system uh, and uh, really just, uh, you know, have a grasp in uh, their heads like what's going on, right? Which is a, actually a speed up the company development and so on, which I think is quite interesting, right? which is like it's faster to integrate, iterate and so on. But again, downsides, it's end to end, it's, it's a really novel approach, right? So it's uh, hard to test, uh, hard to explain. This is where uh, I put a lot of effort into offline evaluation efforts that we can discuss. And uh, uh, yeah, and then, and then the last challenge would be to uh, that, uh, as of now, is still, like kind of there's a struggle with a good hardware where you can run this because you can hear that all these open AI models, they want a lot of GPUs and so on, but we want to run that on a car. And so, yeah, there are struggles uh, with how to do that efficiently. Yeah. Sure. That makes sense. That makes sense. And that's really interesting, I think, to have the thought, like you say, of rather it being quite component driven and really working on a singular component, having almost, I guess, as I'd describe it, a singular brain, which which is able to to learn based on certain scenarios um, and, of course, certain development and research that's implemented as well. But um, for those components to really link together in a much more efficient and successful way compared to maybe traditional, traditional techniques, I think um, it's super interesting for me. And that leads me on quite nicely to the next point, which I think the autonomous vehicle industry comes with a host of challenges, right? Both not just technical, but from a regulation perspective, from a, um, a, a social and public responsibility perspective, a safety perspective as well. Um, and I think it's probably, from my perspective, one of the toughest uh, industries when we think about AI and machine learning and computer vision, given the limited room for error. I think when you're actually rolling out these um, prototypes or, or the, the autonomous vehicles, there really isn't much room for error whatsoever. Um, and of course, it comes with potential risks as well. Um, so maybe share with our listeners some of the biggest challenges that you see that Wave is working on. But I think also from an autonomous vehicle point of view, in particular cars on, on public roads is probably what I'm referring to here, because I think certainly... Um, public interest in autonomous vehicles has been present for, for many years, um, certainly when the concept was, was started to be focused on a lot more. Um, but maybe there was an air of expectation that the we would be seeing these uh, unmanned vehicles on the roads and, and that was going to be part of the norm. And we're not there yet, right? So yeah. talk to our listeners about some of those core challenges, maybe why we're not there yet 
um, and some of the things that businesses like Wave are, are really having to be conscious of. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, this is uh, why we are not there yet. This is, that's a big <laughs> one. Uh, but uh, yeah, let's start uh, from the beginning, uh, I guess, of your question uh, is, uh, you know, about safety, right? So a Wave is a safety first company, like pretty much, well, uh, as many company uh, has to be in, uh, in that space. Uh, so it's safety extremely seriously. Uh, we have, uh, uh, as, as, right, uh, as of now, our cars are tested with uh, uh, safety uh, pilot in, in, in inside, and uh, those people who drive, uh, who like uh, monitor those vehicles, uh, are really uh, professionals, right? So we hire, uh, you know, instructors or other drivers. They have like years of experience, so they actually know. For example, like being an instructor is a, is a good uh, is a good experience. Is kind of uh, really really beneficial here because. You know, this neural network is kind of like a student, right? It might do those mistakes. And, uh, you know, you want to be monitoring like all this uh, potentially, uh, you know, weird behaviors. And those people are really uh, n n nice for that. And they are doing extremely great job, right? So we always super safe on that part, right? And then obviously the main challenge is, uh, uh, yeah. And then uh, when, when something comes up, drivers intervene, take control and uh, everything like goes on, right? So they never got into any troubles. For that and then obviously the main challenge is to decrease this number of interventions right so you want to intervene as uh, least as possible right and then eventually not intervene uh and uh, uh this is like obviously challenge number one just solve navigation itself right so that it's safe and uh and so on and uh, we by the way also probably if we have time we are doing it with cameras uh camera based uh, navigation it's uh, more tricky than to do it with lidars, so there's like another challenge. Uh, but yeah, so we're kind of trying to minimize interventions. Uh, but the whole uh, a few other challenges is that uh, it's actually it would be quite nice to not even drive to understand that you are about to have interventions. So there's a lot of work that we're doing internally that is not really advertised much, and a lot of companies are doing the same. Is this concept of uh, offline evaluation, where you're trying to off-road, offline, you know. Uh, understand as much as possible all possible failure modes and uh, these are the parts where uh, we worked a lot and me myself as well so specifically we have a simulation team uh, which uses uh, different parts uh, different technologies like traditional gaming based simulation and uh, new novel uh, nerve uh, neural based simulation advertise a little bit world models which is uh, this kind of simulating uh, again neural, using neural technologies uh, and uh, we kind of, it's, it's a big like Swiss cheese model, right? If you know this uh, analogy where you're kind of trying to catch as much as possible of different types of errors. <laughs> so using all sorts of simulation technologies to catch this and that, and maybe controller errors and so on and so on before we even get to the road. And uh, with end-to-end, -end, it is specifically tricky because, uh, you know, uh, when you have components, you can uh, isolate a component, right? Set of tests for that component. Uh, and extensively, you know, test ins and outs and so on. But for a testing end to end approach, you really pretty much uh, forced to generate the whole city or the whole environment. And this is where uh, I worked in this uh, very important learning agents that uh, we might discuss later. And uh, uh, this, but the whole concept of offline evaluation for end to end system is really this field that Wave is pioneering together. Well, there are some other companies also working on that, right? But we're just really doing it for quite some time now so we just have quite exp quite some experience on how to test those like a big uh kind of black black boxes well they're not black they we know what's inside right but i mean have to simulate the whole thing right and uh yeah this is a, another big challenge right and then and together with that it comes how do you iterate quickly right because you want to yeah. you know that you're not going to solve it like uh this uh, self-driving right away you're going to slowly decrease interventions then you have to measure that correctly, you have to remove noise, uh, and so on, so on, so on. Yeah, and then uh, the, the most uh, complicated question is like, why we are not there yet. Uh, yeah, it's kind of, <laughs> yeah, well, people underestimated uh, uh, what's up, right? So, I mean, uh, uh, what can I say? I mean, it's uh, it's just a lot of small things. Uh, it's uh, this uh, heavy tail events that uh, just keep coming. Uh, it's uh, uh, this fact that, uh, I don't know. So I learned to drive in California, and then I had to relearn re re in London. It's completely different, right? So many people, <laughs> yeah, just like uh, people don't obey the rules uh, here much. And that's fine. So and uh, you have to be, 
yeah, so you have to take it uh, in, into account human factor as well, right? The fact that all humans driving differently. And uh, yeah, at the beginning, uh, when you solve it in a desert, uh, I guess in DARPA, right? And then Waymo started, people underestimated all those things. And uh, yeah, I guess that's a simple answer uh, for this very complex. Yeah, yeah, and you're right. And I think, I, I don't know off the top of my head of a, a kind of an industry and application when we think about technologies that, that you're working with where the problem is so complex in a sense of such an uncontrolled environment. Um, if you think when you drive day to day, the amount of instances that happen, or maybe you have to um, be more cautious because someone's walking about to cross the road or you perceive them to be doing that. I think when we think about robotics or autonomous robots in, in warehouses and so on, even so, although very complex, it's still extremely controlled, right? And I think the um, the margin for error is much smaller compared to an environment where anything can happen. Um, and so I completely understand, personally, I understand why why maybe we're not there yet, uh, I think. But at the same time, I think there's been huge advancements. There's been huge successes. I mean, even seeing Waves vehicles, albeit manned, I think, traveling in such a complicated um, ecosystem such as um, such as London, I think is, is super impressive. So no doubt, no doubt we'll reach the, yeah. the, the, the point where you want to be soon. Um, and something you, you mentioned, you've mentioned already around your approach with computer vision in your technologies, which I think is an interesting one because many of the major players within autonomous driving, they're heavily focused quite often on sensors and in particular LIDAR based sensor technologies and with great success as well, right? Um, but talk to us about the core differences between LIDAR-based self-driving versus what you're doing with more computer vision-based self-driving. And I think maybe then pivoting on some of the pros of, of using the computer vision techniques, but also some of the cons and some of the challenges again. Yeah, yeah. So uh, first of all, for those who, who don't know, LIDARs are those sensors that emit laser uh, arrays, uh, which you know keep surfaces reflect and... Uh, uh, what you get from it is a 3D point cloud, kind of 3D structure of the world around you. And uh, the reason why it's kind of simpler to start with LiDARs is because, uh, the, you know, the whole concept of being safe, right, is not to, you know, obviously get into contact with anything, right? And hence you're getting this uh, 3D structure of the world right away. You don't need to do much processing while well, comparing to computer vision. Uh, you immediately get... Uh, you know, kind of head start in terms of uh, not being able to like bump into stuff and know like where, where to go, right? So this is the immediate benefit of lighters, right? Plus they are less noisy in a certain sense for certain materials, obviously like uh, exceptions and so on. I work quite a lot of uh, lighters and they give you quite precise uh, depth. Uh, so the precision of it is pretty, pretty nice, right? Just again, depending on the model. Uh, but uh, yeah, the thing is that uh, you know, one kind of argument for computer vision is that uh, cities are actually designed for people, right? And people happen to not have laser eyes, uh, you know, we happen to have <laughs> irregular eyes, which are RGB sensors, right? Uh, well, uh, uh, light sensors. So that's why you just cannot emit, well, in robotics and in indoor, you pretty much it's possible to navigate without vision. Uh, in uh, cities, you cannot, for example, get traffic lights. That's it, right? So you have to you have to have vision right it's a, it's it's not a, sure. it's not negotiable so that's why vision component has to be there uh and uh and again and everything is designed around it like blinkers and uh all sorts of uh road markings because you don't sense them with lidar and uh all, all that stuff they're designed for people to see and hence uh, the computer vision aspect in uh, outdoor self-driving is always huge right so that's why you always have vision right so then kind of from a perspective of being minimalistic, right? You would say, well, how would how about you go other way around where you know that vision is sufficient, right? Because design uh, for humans who have only vision and obviously ears, right? But then it's a different story. <laughs> and uh, how about you just do that instead, right? Instead of instead of uh, starting with LiDAR and adding vision, you go from vision and you add the structure that you can infer from uh, visual input. This is where uh, all these approaches come in, right? And uh, again, Tesla is a big player in that, basing only on on cameras with a few other small sensors like ultrasound, uh, maybe ra uh, radar. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, kind of another thing is that where it's connected with end-to-end -end approaches is, is that uh, right now, state-of-the-art vision is actually end-to-end -end deep, deep networks. So there is 
uh, other classical technologies are not, you know, very competitive in computer vision. Whereas in other okay. parts like SLAM and more, you know, motion planning, maybe LiDAR navigation, you still can do some uh, classical kind of approaches, right? So you kind of have to go with deep learning. Uh, and this is natural for us to just bet on at the same time deep learning uh, all end to end and computer vision it kind of makes company really focused uh and so on right and then there is a again more uh kind of arguable uh well kind of uh, argument about uh human eyes right so we just kind of know okay uh you know we're navigating with those cameras right but i mean but this is a, when you start reading about this this is like a flaky argument to be honest i mean sometimes people use it but I mean, our eyes is really it's incredible devices, right? We have this OVS that can have incredible resolution in the center. We can move our head, whereas if you fix camera, you uh, start having blind spots and so on. So yeah, this is uh, kind of arguable, but uh, yeah, Amora coming from this perspective of having a minimalistic approach where you just focus all your efforts on a single sensor, right? Uh, obviously we do fuse that with, uh, let's say, you know, GPS and velocity, which are like reliable, simple things, right? Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, pretty much uh, uh, other companies are slowly also kind of uh, probably going that route, right? Where, uh, but at the same time, in lidars are also getting cheaper. Yeah, another thing, lidars are quite expensive always. Right? So cameras are okay. may, may, uh, are quite uh, you know quite cheap compared to lidars. So generally, they're they're lower cost option yeah. to computer vision. Yeah, although um, although that's uh, yeah, because just because lidar is such a novel sensor in a sense, of, but uh, that is slowly changing. Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to be an argument in the future, but uh, yeah. And can the systems can the systems if you're using a lidar sensor, um, I'm assuming it's there's limitations in what it's then feeding back to to the system in terms of learning, right? Because from the sounds of it, lidar is very good at just identifying there's something there, stop, rather than actually p uh, having a perception of what was there, yeah. how how you should navigate that, and then I guess taking those learnings away to be able to overcome that obstacle again if it to arise. Is that is that correct? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, roughly. I mean, uh, uh, yeah. What lidar gives you uh, natively, like the at least classically. I mean, maybe people are you know, improving that. Just gives you the shape of stuff, right? So from that shape, you actually can infer whether it's a cyclist or, or, or a car or, or, or a human pedestrian. Uh, so in that way, you in principle, uh, and then people, people obviously do that, uh, you can infer, okay, well, that, that, that shape does look like a human, hence uh, I'm going to predict that uh, that shape is going to cross the road. And, uh, but uh, uh, right now, uh, mainly people just fuse it together with vision because from vision, you have quite a strong signal, uh, uh, you know, what, what is it? there right and uh, uh so, so it's kind of it's both right it's a grayscale right it's not like yes or no it's more like yeah you can do object detection from lidar as well but from vision you okay. typically it's 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 more typical to do it from vision i guess right but uh, people do it from both as modality sure sure understood appreciate that and and now let's let's talk a bit more around uh, the technologies way is utilizing um and and how you're utilizing them to achieve its goals um, or your goals. So in particular, I think something that really interests me when we first met was the discussion we had around exploring the use of LLMs, so large language models, um, which I think is becoming more and more of a buzzword these days with the emergence or, um, of certain technologies in AI, um, but also the use of reinforced learning um, through simulated cities, I think is, is a super interesting topic. Um, certainly, like I say, one that I find fascinating. So, talk us through a bit more around those those factors and the technologies that you're exploring. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, language models. Yeah, it's this uh, interesting development, which is very surprising to me and to many people. Really, is this? Uh, Always thinking, well, how do cars need language? How does that yeah, make sense? Yeah, yeah. That's uh, yeah. That's uh, that's the second question, right? But I mean, the, the, uh, yeah. The first one is that I I, I didn't expect uh, myself to be working in that field, to be honest. Uh, because uh, you know, originally I was always doing, always working on the RL, reinforcement learning, you know, controls, uh, other machine learning, right? And the language uh, domain was always about translation and uh, you know, and so on. So on. But then uh, later, what happened is that uh, language models started to show uh, kind of signs of reasoning, right? And they started uh, uh, beating benchmarks on actual uh, good reasoning, uh, good human level reasoning, which you know everyone right now uh, probably experience with uh, 
GPTs, chat GPT, etc. And uh, and since I was always uh, kind of interested in uh, uh, motion control, you know, movement and and reasoning, uh, yeah, I kind of started uh, go, going that path. So uh, also it's, it's kind of coming from neuroscience a little bit, where uh, before we we knew that how to do perception. Uh, with the deep learning, right? We knew how to do end-to-end -end, uh, recognition of objects, etc. Spatial uh, uh, techniques, uh, spatial and uh, spatial understanding, right? But in terms of decision making, it was always uh, it was always a set of algorithms on top. For example, like Mu Zero, that uh, Alpha, I know AlphaGo and uh, 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 examples uh, like that. They add planning. Uh, it's still end-to-end, -end, but planning on top of several systems. And then people mixed the motion planning together with deep learning, right? But there was never uh, a solution that kind of does everything end to end, right? And then the moment uh, I saw uh, those language models, I found okay, well that that is the way to end to end decision make, right? So hence, if you combine that with end to end perception that we kind of knew how to do, right? That gives you a big end to end system that is human level, right? Which is Finally closes that that gap where you know before we kind of didn't know how to do this prefrontal cortex that is that does decision making really right we knew mm -hmm. visual uh, parts which which are doing vision right but now it's clear that okay well those technologies uh, could be one single algorithm uh, that actually does everything right and hence it's just okay. ex exciting from that perspective just to be like this unified single algorithm that can do. Uh, with deep learning, uh, perception and motion and, and decision making, uh, etc. And uh, uh, well, I mean, well, why do we need, uh, yeah, it's a kind of a decision making? Well, I mean, a language in self driving. So yeah, this is a still exploratory project, right? It's just uh, uh, all this uh, language uh, uh, efforts uh, took off across the world, you know, roughly in December, I would say, right? When like everyone experienced ChatGPT and so on. Uh, so, yeah, so for, first of all, again, uh, coming from just uh, uh, intuition, right? So humans uh, do reason a lot while driving, right? So when we start uh, driving in a new city, like, uh, you know, I was experiencing recently, you just come to this roundabout and you're sitting in the wrong place, being a left, you know, left-handed lane, right? And you're like, okay, I'm here and there's a person coming from the right or left and then so on. You, you have this explicit verbal reasoning, what's going on. And which later, only later, after you have some experience, you kind of do it automatically. But first, you ought to even speak with your, you know, companion uh, near, uh, you know, nearby because you cannot at the same time, because you have this reasoning loop trying to understand how to drive. And we slowly always feel like, okay, it's kind of get, gets downloaded uh, lower, right? And then it becomes uh, automatic. Same thing if you're riding a bicycle. You first you do it consciously, uh, trying to, okay, where, how do I steer? But then it becomes automatic. So. Uh, this is like uh, this is one of the things that we want to, to have as well, where uh, if we get into novel situations that require or complicated situations that require reasoning, then we actually uh, start doing it in a verbal space, and then uh, later connect it with, uh, and then kind of it's, it's happening slower, right? When you're reasoning as a human as well, you kind of slow down, right? So we also uh, want to do that, right? So you. One slow down, reason about the situation and bias your uh, automatic policy, automatic driving kind of algorithm to uh, uh, to, to comply to kind of to your decisions, right? To, to your reasoning. Uh, and uh, another thing is that those large uh, language models they are trained on all the internet. They know a lot of stuff, right? And this is this uh, again, data is new oil kind of ideas that okay, well if we use that we uh, implicitly having access to the data that Wave, uh, you know, and many companies did not, you know, even thought about using. But now we suddenly, for example, uh, plugging it in, we have uh, immediate understanding on, let's say, uh, London speed limits, right? If you ask speed limits, you you know, it knows uh, what are the speed limits and so on. So we get this a knowledge that is just uh, kind of, uh, well, we can reuse that, right? We can reuse all that uh a lot of humanity knowledge, right? Which we, because before we were focusing on just uh, kind of self driving our own data, maybe taking a few other data sources, right? But here now we're just suddenly plugging in this whole human knowledge, right? And obviously there are a few other things like explainability, if it can tell you uh, and you know what's going on, because before it was a big black box that just does decisions, but now it can explain to you 
why it's doing or what it's doing and what it perceives. Okay. Maybe you can ask uh, stuff from such a black box. Uh, yeah, and then, you know, there is a textual part as well. You can maybe read traffic signs, but this is a minor. Yeah, so this is the, these are the kind of insights, but this is quite a novel uh, project that uh, we're doing. Yeah, and then, uh, so the, yeah, so the second project is um, uh, this learned uh, agents and cities, right? So this is uh, also was a quite exciting project that we kind of is still going on. So we had a, a blog post on that. Uh, you're welcome to check it out. Uh, so idea is that um, we know that self-driving is a heavily multi-agent model um, uh, problem because uh, it's not only about static obstacles, right? There are all humans and cyclists and uh, I don't know, uh, Uber drivers delivering food on scooters and et cetera, et cetera. And all these dynamic uh, factors are really a big deal, especially for Wave that focuses on London deployment, uh, uh, like central London deployment. And uh, we decided to uh, simulate that uh, in like a big city, but uh, again, since we're betting on machine learning, uh, we decided to do it with reinforcement learning where every agent, uh, you know, cyclists and, uh, you know, buses even and, and cars, obviously, uh, they have their own goals and they learn what to do in the big kind of multi-agent setup where they all try to negotiate with each other. And after you've done learning, you actually end up with quite realistic behaviors where those agents uh, learn uh, behaviors which are maybe uh, well, they're quite similar to human behaviors, but also they could be quite weird, which is also good for us because in the simulator, you want to try to test as much as possible on the, uh, this heavy tail cases that you never experience. So if anyone is behaving really strange, it's also a good idea for us in that case. So okay. uh, so we kind of bet on this like big hundreds of agent uh, cities. So, yeah. Okay. And so, the, and I guess the the as you say, the point with that is to really try and um, encourage as much as possible for your systems to be learning, uh, particularly on um, in built up areas, whether it be simulated or not. But I think, by the sounds of it, most importantly, unpredicted scenarios, yeah. right? Rather than rather than the obvious of um, if there's a red light, you stop, or if there's a human in front of you, then then stop and yeah, so yeah. on. So I think, and and that's a really interesting kind of topic. And I wonder, so is your work split between Kind of that that simulated piece is that versus then also implementing um, what we're seeing a lot of media coverage around in in terms of then your vehicles in in the real world. So I guess there's two arms to to what you're working on. In that yeah, sense. yeah. So th this is a, again the this beauty of uh, this approach where you kind of uh, can comprehend the whole system. Uh, one person can do that, uh, and uh, hence you're kind of working on everything in a sense, right? I mean. Uh, uh, you know, uh, as of right now, I'm mainly focusing on this language, right? But before I was focusing on simulation, uh, on, uh, on this RL agent simulation. Uh, yeah, so then uh, yeah, pretty much everyone in the company kind of always uh, switches between different uh, projects to just uh, because different things stop working kind of, right? So, uh, yeah. Sure, understood. And, and I think... Um... We've touched on it already around safety and, and of course how critical that is, particularly in your field. Um, now, I think it, it's extremely public how successful Wave have been. Um, I think they were one of, if not the first, to to launch an unmanned vehicle using the technologies that you do. Um, and you're certainly advancing uh, very quickly towards potential full autonomy. Um, and I think this has been showcased, that success is certainly showcased by the level of investment that you received last year and, and prior to that as well, right? So I'm curious to know, and I'm sure lots of people may be, particularly outside of the autonomous vehicle industry, I think one of the number one things that you say is is how safe is that? So for a company like Wave, um, and maybe it's unique to Wave, but talk us through um, kind of the, 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 the steps towards us that you're taking towards a safe kind of fully autonomous system uh yeah so uh first of all again now uh, that i kind of uh, discussed before this complete uh, testing in, in internally like all sorts of simulations and agents and so on safety drivers obviously right and then uh yeah there are many components uh, uh to safety and, and here also one thing that we kind of haven't discussed is this uh, uh idea of uh uh, not just going, uh, going kind of, okay, you have nothing and suddenly you have full self-driving car. So uh, typically company try to design also business models and partnerships in a way where you have certain gradient from, you know, nothing, right, to 
uh, pool uh, belongs to kind of zero to hero kind of idea where you uh, just gradually, uh, you know, uh, ramp up your uh, self-driving and take the critical capabilities, right? So what uh, uh, what we have, we, we, uh, and every company has different focus, right? So some companies, for example, uh, self-driving trucks, they don't even have to remove the driver from inside because, you know, there are some benefits to self-driving trucks even with a driver inside, like maybe insurance and so on and uh, uh, all sorts of stuff, right? And then, uh, so Tesla is doing their own thing, right? Where they, you know, they keep safety driver and they, uh, you know, safety driver actually buys, uh, actually pays money to Tesla to test uh, the pilot, right? And then, uh, right. The, yeah, so companies like Waymo, they go, uh, you know, they deploy in a small uh, cities and then slowly grow the number of cities and so on. So, yeah, we are, are uh, also pursuing like certain component kind of based uh, uh, gradient approach, right? Where we, first of all, we start, uh, we right away start in a challenging environment in central London, but it's quite slow, right? So we are not pursuing right away, let's say highway, so like really high speed scenarios, right? That gives us some room, you know, to, uh, to, to experiment with our stuff, right? Then uh, uh, we, with this partnership with the grocery uh, delivery partnership, we're really testing this business model uh, what exactly and when the, uh, it's necessary to automate versus not, etc. And uh, this is where we see this is like a, again big trade off uh, between uh, risk and reward, right? You kind of want to uh, design your business such that obviously it's completely safe, uh, but you still get some benefits. So we are right now in the grocery trials, grocery delivery trials, right? Uh, and uh, you know, meanwhile, uh, there are other things that I mentioned with. Uh, Safety, right? But also you want to uh, ramp up uh, explainability as well, right? For many reasons, for trust, uh, for public trust, where you want to have a lot of uh, uh, kind of ideas on uh, how to make your system uh, trustworthy, such that you uh, you know can explain its decisions, uh, and even post factum you can analyze the data. So there's a lot of work that we're doing how to kind of cover that part, right? To just understand what went wrong, if anything, right? And then understand and keep improving, right? So this is pretty much all the sure. aspects, all this uh, challenge to, uh, you know, slowly get to driverless car, yeah. And I think it's really interesting with the simulated cities piece, like you say, because I think that's a, a really effective way for you to be able to trial your your systems, right? And to to see almost real world how they how they react to certain scenarios that maybe even a human would would, would struggle to yeah. react to. And I think, um, and I think the whole use of computer vision as well, I think, is super interesting in a sense that. Um, the, the perception that it can it can give and the learnings that you can draw from that, but also the hallucinations that there can be, and and I think tackling that from a from from a system perspective and on how does the system recognise when maybe a computer vision or the image that they're seeing maybe isn't isn't what it might think that it's doing. I think it's you know those the, the work that you seem to be doing and the research that's going into that. I think yeah. is. Um, seems to be certainly the difference between kind of where where we are today with 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 some success to being kind yeah, of yeah and, and then there are a lot of uh one thing i guess i didn't mention there, there are a lot of this data driven loops inside the company right there is a you know some uh loops that just to improve a simulator right we want to go outside uh, uh collect the data where we're failing or succeeding and then simulate that effectively right it is loop number one right and then there's a there are loops inside where they're all data driven. We try to be as data driven as possible. How well are you simulating humans, for example, in those cities? What is not being caught by a simulator, right? Do we need to design extra technology to, let's say, you know, design another type of uh, integration tests? Or uh, there are so many things that can fail. There are latency tests and controllers and drivers and so on. So we always uh, kind of going in this loops trying to. Um, design as as many as this this kind of loops that uh, catch that back and uh, confine uh, all these errors before we go outside right but then obviously outside we have other safety nets etc so we're trying to embed it in many many different uh, loops of data sure understood and one thing i'm curious about that i hadn't covered is um i'm intrigued to know when it comes to different weather conditions i'm assuming that's something that you factor in to to the trials and the simulations that you're doing and and how the um again how the, the the environment is perceived whether it be i guess 
foggy or it's raining compared to a kind of traditional clear day is that again is that something that's that's you're needing to work on in, in how well your systems can perceive those, those yeah yeah, yeah. Environments? So, so this is uh, again it's kind of in a together with the trials right we're trying to understand the okay, gates well first of all we also try to constrain the time right so we don't we're not we're not we're not going right 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 away uh uh you know kind of cover all weathers uh as of now right uh we're just like starting slowly right so we first of all limiting uh you know to day driving right now although you know in the future we might start with night driving uh but in terms of weathers you know uh yeah london is quite <laughs> rich in uh, terms of different weather you can experience which is nice and uh, uh we obviously simulate that on all sorts of uh, different in, in different domains right we simulate in like game driven uh, uh simulation develop uh simulator where uh professional kind of game developers try to do the most realistic weather you can think right but then also there's an interesting factor of how does weather uh affect sensors right so for example droplets on cameras right so it's not enough just to simulate visuals of a rain let's say you would rather the kind of the most detrimental would be to simulate droplets on camera which is a bit different kind of right mm -hmm. so maybe you can have it from puddles right it's not necessarily <laughs> weather uh and uh yeah then we have this technology called uh a nerves it's like a, a kind of novel a technology people uh, started doing it uh, quite recently where we also try to simulate different uh, conditions uh, and weather since a neural simulation. And again, uh, world models is yet another way that we can, uh, in, in world models in the demos that uh, we presented uh, like literally last week, uh, uh, you can see examples uh, on the website and blog post uh, where you condition the world model, this neural kind of imaginary model, uh, which weather you want to simulate on which day and uh, time it's either it's night driving or okay. day driving and uh yeah this is like yet another way we address this weather stuff uh, weather conditions right but then obviously we deploy we see what's missing and put it back into our testing stack good good no i appreciate that insight thank you very much and and i think before before we wrap up i wanted to um to touch briefly on hiring at wave because um of course, we've spoken about the investment, and I think naturally that comes with not just enhanced technologies and investment into the work that you're doing, but naturally um, huge growth as well, which I know you've been through um, strong periods of growth um, where you're seeing exponential growth in, in different teams. So I think particularly for people, for those who are listening or, or watching this episode um, and are intrigued and their interest is peaked by wave, um, talk to us a bit around the typical skills you look for um, the types of skills that you're um, you're intrigued by does that need to be a background in robotics autonomous systems of some sort um, is it predominantly on research engineering I'm sure there's 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 huge um, opportunities throughout different teams but maybe give us a brief overview not exclusive yeah. but a brief overview of typically what what you're you're really interested yeah so right, in. right now wave is about uh, 200 people so currently uh, you know we're mainly focusing on hiring um, uh, in research, research manager, mainly like seniors in research, principal, uh, scientist, senior scientists and research uh, managers. Uh, but also there are a lot of software uh, opening, software engineering, because, uh, yeah, there is a big component of that, which is navigation and research, etc. But uh, uh, there are so much work on, there's so much work on all sorts of software, uh, kind of more like uh, regular issues, but still state of the art stuff, for example, like data. Uh, the way we manage, manage the data, we have data from six cameras. How do you scalably record that, etc.? So there's a lot of software engineering in that. Then there are a lot of uh, there's a lot of work in, on a car itself. Uh, so uh, you know, obviously there's uh, the whole stack, uh, the hardware stack, and that's on uh, firmware and so on. Yeah, so mainly right now it's software engineering position, more like senior positions in research, right? And then uh, well, we we always open to a conversation if you have something to show and. Uh, you know, uh, our talent team uh, just uh, you know email a talent uh, wave at AI, and uh, they're really nice people. They're going to engage with you. Just uh, if you have uh, uh, you know any skill set that are kind of relevant or uh, yeah, you kind of ta a talented uh, engineer, then please reach out. Uh, yes, yeah, as, uh, as you said, Floyd, yeah, we kind of going through the growth period. Uh, you know, there is funding. So. Yeah, that's uh, roughly the summary. Yeah. And I think I think 
Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And I think for anyone watching that maybe feels that they're, um, they don't have experience of autonomous driving, I think it's important to say here that that's not necessary um, to be successful, right? I think businesses like Wave and the technologies you're working on, you need skills from, from all sorts of domains, different backgrounds, academia, um, you name it. So I think anyone watching that is interested and wants to be involved in um, who I perceive to be one of the, the major players in kind of breaking down these boundaries of autonomous driving, then for sure, reach out to Oleg. I'll, I'll also drop the, the career site link in um, below so that you can you can also explore that and maybe some links to the um some of the blog posts that you mentioned before as well um but as always a massive thank you to to you oleg for for sharing the story of wave and and some of the technologies that you're working on i think um like i say i've worked in the the, the ai space for, for almost 10 years and i think autonomous driving is definitely one that personally I find super intriguing um, and how those boundaries are going to be broken, how those those difficulties are going to be challenged as well. Um, anyone watching, please like, share, comment. Um, and, and as I said before, if you are someone who has the skills and experience that Oleg mentioned and you feel that you'd be a good fit and want to be on the journey with Wave, then then check the links below um, and, and reach out to their talent team. But thanks again, yeah, thanks Oleg. So. All yeah, the thanks, best. Uh, thank, thanks a lot, Floyd. Yeah, Thank right. you. Okay, bye-bye. Hey guys, thanks for watching this episode. Uh, massively appreciate you listening and checking in with us. If you want to find out more about us and what we're doing, please check us out on social media. What we're trying to do at Engineers is build a community to drive knowledge, sharing and experiences. On Twitter, we can be found at engineers.io. It's no underscore. We've also got a website, which is engineers.io. These links will all be posted in the description. Any feedback and comments are massively appreciated. We're always looking to improve on where we can. Thanks, guys.